Map Chats. Hello, and welcome to our Map Chats webinar on mapping community health. I'm Morgan Robinson, a data analyst here at Policy Map. For those of who are for those of you who are signing on to Map Chats for the first time, Policy Map, the organization behind this webinar series, is a national online mapping service. Map Chats is a free webinar series that invites experts from a variety of disciplines to discuss how their work incorporates data and maps, giving our audience a chance to learn more about the role of maps in the everyday work of practitioners and policymakers. We're presenting this webinar today because as data people, our understanding of neighborhood health is often complicated by a general lack of easily accessible, fine-grained health data. Today we'll see a few different examples of maps using administrative health data, and we'll peek behind the scenes to see some of the work that goes into creating indicators to inform policy and improve health outcomes. Dr. Patrick Sullivan from Emory University and Arti Virkud from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene will be sharing how they use data and maps to improve care and community well-being. Before we dive into the presentations, some housekeeping. Everyone is currently muted. If you have questions during the presentations, please use the GoToWebinar panel. Just type in the control panel and we'll respond to you directly or we'll read your question during Q&A. After the presentations, we'll have a Q&A session and we'll aim to leave at least 20 minutes at the end. And to answer our most popular question, we will be recording this map chat. We'll post the video to our YouTube channel and we'll email out the link to that and the slideshow. All of our map chats materials are archived on our blog. And you can use the hashtag map chats to join the conversation on Twitter. So please go ahead and do that. So let's kick off with a presentation from Dr. Patrick Sullivan of Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. Patrick Sullivan is a professor of epidemiology and co-director of the Pre Prevention Sciences Core at Emory's Center for AIDS Research. Dr. Sullivan's research focuses on HIV among men who have sex with men, including behavioral research, interventions, and surveillance. Previously, Dr. Sullivan worked as the chief of the Behavioral and Clinical Surveillance Branch at CDC, implementing HIV research studies and surveillance systems to meet critical local, state, and national HIV prevention needs. He is the PI of NIH-funded studies to determine reasons for black and white disparities in HIV among MSM, to pilot HIV prevention packages among MSM in South Africa, to evaluate distribution of at-home HIV test kits to MSM in the US, and to develop and test a comprehensive mobile prevention app for gay and bisexual men. He is also the principal scientist of AIDSview.org and HIVcontinuum.org. All right, Patrick, you're the presenter. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> and uh, I really appreciate the chance to be here and, and talk today about AIDSview, uh, which really in our, um, in our conception is exactly the kind of um, tool that you're talking about to take data that already exists in the world but present them in ways that can be used to improve community health, improve health outcomes. So I am um, a, a longtime um, sort of uh, public health surveillance uh, aficionado or some might say junkie. And, um, and I, I had the privilege of working uh, for many years at CDC, working in the surveillance system that produced these surveillance reports that really give us an amazing level of granular detail about what's happening with HIV in the United States. The primary products of that system are surveillance reports, which are used for all kinds of policy and, um, and educational purposes, like the table that you see here. But there are different ways of presenting and understanding data, and so, for example, this is a picture of the AIDS quilt, which in another way enumerates lives touched by HIV, but adds a lot of other context to, the, context, um, to that enumeration. And so I have a quote here from the dean of our School of Public Health, Jim Curran, who ran the HIV surveillance program for many years, who says surveillance is the conscience of the epidemic. And I think what that says to me is that surveillance data really map out in an objective way the where's and the who's 
um, of who is most infected by most impacted by the epidemic, and and relentlessly remind us of where our responsibilities are in prevention. AIDSview.org is a compilation of interactive online maps that are aimed at letting people visually explore the HIV epidemic in the U.S. and putting alongside that information about where HIV is occurring other critical resources like HIV testing, like finding places to get treated. And our goal is to take these data which in a table format um, may be less relatable to people and to make them widely accessible and locally relevant. So um, it's one thing to understand in the national sense where the epidemic is, but I also want to know what it looks like in the place that I live. So we try to provide users with an intuitive visual way to connect with this complex information about who's living with an HIV diagnosis at a variety of different geographic levels. We, our site um, is primarily built around interactive maps, and so um, what you see here are two views of different kinds of data. Um, I'm going to uh, in shortly uh, show you what the site actually looks like, but these are the main event, which is the maps. These illustrate people living with HIV, uh, with an HIV diagnosis um, at the state level, at the county level, which is what you see depicted on the top, top map here, and then in cities down to the zip, load, zip code census tract or neighborhood level. And this, I'm going to talk about how this information can be used to improve our services and make sure we're aligning resources with the areas of greatest need. We also present data on people newly diagnosed with HIV at the state and county level. That's the map that appears on the bottom. And then I'll be showing you some examples of um, putting these data side by side with social determinants of health, meaning information about things like poverty, insurance coverage, education, to see how these social determinants of health correlate with the areas most impacted with, with, by HIV. And an important part of our site is that we understand that it's not enough merely to describe where um, people living with HIV are, are most concentrated, but also to link that to positive public health action. So over any of these maps, you can overlay HIV testing locations, um, uh, Ryan White supported treatment locations. And one of the key questions that people use our maps to ask is whether the, the overlay of where we're providing services aligns with where the greatest burden of need is. We also illustrate with service locators NIH-funded uh, uh, HPTN, or prevention trial sites, vaccine and treatment trial sites, again, to depict that in the context of the, where the greatest burden of um, disease uh, is in the country. One of the things we try to do is pull out some sort of quick facts and make them handy for folks who may, you know, not uh, may, may have a less uh, detailed or numerical interest in the epidemic. This is an example of our local statistics for the state of California, where people can get a quick look at the number of people living with HIV, the number of new diagnoses, deaths, and then some information about who those people living with HIV in the state are um, in terms of uh, men and women, racial ethnic groups, and by transmission group. And these are available for all 50 states and for 35 uh, U.S. cities. I also mentioned the testing locators. So this is an illustration of Washington, um, D.C. And overlaid here, um, we have HIV treatment sites or Ryan White uh, HIV AIDS medical care providers. This search is accessible uh, by zip code, by city um, and state, by county. And we also have a comparable locator for HIV testing locations. Another one of our resources are slide decks that have high resolution maps um, and data sets. The maps, actually, the ones that I'm going to show you are not the interactive maps that are on the site, just because of our time constraints, but are illustrations of those maps. And all of the images that you'll see that I'm presenting are actually available to download as PowerPoint slides. These also have written scripts to go along with them so that you can use them in your presentations to illustrate uh, the impact and distribution of HIV in the places that matter to you. We're very intentional that we want AIDSview to support the national HIV AIDS strategy and its goals of preventing new infections, improving linkage to prevention, care, and treatment, and reducing HIV-related health disparities. 
And so I want to show you now some examples of uh, data and maps from, uh, from the site and illustrate some of the principles we've been discussing. This is an overall look of the distribution of people living with an HIV diagnosis by county in 2012. And it illustrates um, a story that many of us have been uh, hearing actively in the HIV community for the past several years, which is the concentration of the epidemic in the South. One thing that I would point out in this map is that although you get a visual impression from the darker shading of counties in the South of the higher, uh, higher rates of HIV in the, in the southern United States, it's also interesting to look um, in some of these states like Georgia, like Alabama, where there are very heavily impacted counties by rates, even outside of the major metropolitan areas. So we see heavily impacted counties in terms of rates in southern Georgia, southern Alabama, and along the Mississippi River in Mississippi. This indicates with a finer level of granularity where the epidemic is most concentrated in the south. There are comparable maps that show rates of people diagnosed with HIV and again illustrates that in the south there's generally a greater impact but also uh, a heterogeneity of impact between urban and rural areas. The next slide is a zip code level slide that shows um, uh, rates of people living with HIV or AIDS uh, uh, diagnosis in Philadelphia by zip code. And maps like these have been used by, um, by uh, researcher and program specialists who want to do HIV testing. And one of the, the truths about um, the, our epidemics is that areas that have large uh, concentrations of people living with HIV are also generally areas in which HIV testing resources are needed. And so uh, uh, program um, researchers from Brown have used maps like these to figure out the, the specific neighborhoods uh, in which door-to-door -door HIV testing should be done in order to bring testing to the specific parts of the city in greatest need of these services. Um, uh, Morgan mentioned earlier fine-grained detail, and this is an example of census tract level maps in Chicago. We often think of urban areas as areas that are uniformly heavily impacted by HIV. But as this map of Chicago indicates, even within a city like Chicago, there's a lot of variation. So the most darkly shaded purple uh, census tract indicate four to eight block square areas um, where nearly 3% of the population in those census tracts are living with HIV. And often they may be bordered very closely by other census tracts where well under 1% of uh, the residents in that census tract are living with HIV. Again, this speaks to the ability to target prevention interventions and resources. Many people uh, would know that what zip code they live in, but perhaps not what census, which census tract. Um, one of the things we've heard from our partners in health departments is that uh, expressing uh, impact or burden of HIV infection in terms of neighborhoods is a powerful way for, to help people relate um, where they live to uh, the occurrence of HIV disease. So this is a map of neighborhood level uh, HIV prevalence from San Francisco. Um, the series of maps that you'll find, one slide deck for every state, one for um, nearly all of our cities on AIDS view, will show you views according to different subgroups. So for example, this is rates of H people living with HIV or AIDS diagnosis among those 25 to 44 in Philadelphia. The next view shows side-by-side shows -side maps of rates among black um, residents of Philadelphia and white residents. And what this illustrates is the striking disparities between uh, HIV epidemics among black and white Americans in a way that sort of gives a little more dimension and depth um, to a story that we're all sadly familiar with. Um, other important correlations speak to how we understand the social determinants of health. So this is our same map of Philadelphia, but we've now shown it side by side with poverty rates. Within the darkest blue shaded areas on the right side of the slide, um, about uh, more than one in five people are living in poverty, and those overlap um, to a great extent with those zip codes where the highest prevalence of people living with HIV is found. Similar measures are available for median household income, where here lighter shades indicate a lower median household income. I haven't depicted health insurance coverage or income inequality in these maps. Um, so 
while these uh, data are of re very high quality and collected by our colleagues in state health departments, um, the data that we show come from national data sources at the county level and may differ slightly from what state and local reports use. Our maps include people who are incarcerated, and so sometimes that can result in an artificially um, heavily shaded or high concentration of people living with HIV. They don't reflect undiagnosed cases, and um, just watch as you compare because the scales change when we change from maps by race, race ethnicity to sex or age group breakdowns. Um, we hope that you'll use AZU to get easy access to some quick facts about the ap epidemic. And these are calculated consistently across areas, so you can compare apples to apples. There are slide decks, which um, you can download and use for your talks or projects, downloadable data sets. We hope to use this as a tool to raise awareness of HIV, and we use it also in our uh, public health teaching. Um, there are just a variety of ways to be in touch with us. Uh, there's a bit.ly here to sign up for updates, but also liking us on Facebook, Twitter, and as we add new content, we'll use these channels to reach out to you and let you know that there's new stuff available. And finally, um, we're interested in your ideas about what else we should be mapping. So info, info at aidsview.org will reach me as well as the amazing team of people that we have working on the project um, who I'd like to acknowledge here. And um, I will turn uh, things back over to Morgan. Thanks so much, Patrick. It's, um, those materials are so great, and it's really interesting, especially to see how the data on prevalence and resources can uh, be overlaid to really make, make something actionable. Um, so just as a reminder to our participants, you can send in questions for Dr. Sullivan and all of the presenters using the submission form. Um, you can also tell us where you're from and which presenter you'd like to answer your question. Um, so before we hear from Arti Virkud about New York City's primary care information project, I'm going to be sharing a bit about PolicyMaps health data. Um, so for those of you who don't know, PolicyMap is a mapping tool that provides maps and data visualizations for tens of thousands of indicators related to housing, health, demographics, and more. So over the years, we've collected and mapped lots of data from federal agencies like CDC and HRSA, the Health Resources and uh, Services Administration. We started by mapping the locations of health facilities like hospitals, federal health initiatives, and some, some disease prevalence information because this information is essential to understanding health in a big picture sense. So we can get key population indicators like low birth weight and mortality by cause of death from vital statistics, but privacy concerns lead to low overall coverage, hence the wide gray areas on the map. So this data is useful. You can compare low birth weight by county to the national average and also the Healthy People 2020 goal of 7.8%, um, and you can, you can look at trends. But looking at the map doesn't really tell you a lot about what goes on in communities across the country. So if we consider a social ecological model, an individual's health can only be understood within the framework of policies, relationships, structures, and systems in which they live. These levels provide context for the individual and can help explain how your neighborhood, who you spend time with, and how much money you earn can affect your health just as much as your individual patterns of behavior and genetics. Health can be measured in many different ways. We can look at outcomes, which we often do. Those are things like disease rates and mortality. And we can look at risk factors. For example, increased fruit and vegetable consumption is linked to better cardiovascular health. So while we don't really have a direct measure of the number of, of people at risk for a heart attack, looking at eating patterns, or even access to healthy food in a neighborhood can clue us in. And we can also look at social determinants of health because socioeconomic status and race are known and demonstrated predictors of health. But using only those indicators may not be sufficient to tell the story of how health plays out in communities. And focusing only on demographics may prevent us from considering the societal and policy context for health outcomes. So, if, so over the years, PolicyMap users have asked for nationally comparable local health data. And to make this possible, we look to a longstanding CDC survey, which is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. 
This is a phone survey of over 400,000 people collected by state every year. And the survey questions are variables known to affect health or be directly associated with health outcomes. So knowing that health is related to social structures and systems allows us to create reasonable estimates based on the correlation of birth sex variables to place, rage, race, age, and income. So we sampled the data and modeled these relationships so we can map out not only the statewide rate of obesity in Illinois, according to the survey, but also the estimated rate of obesity for each census tract in Chicago. So here, each census tract's estimate is based on the number of adults within each race, income, and age category whose reported height and weight fall within the, with the, within the obese category. So the estimates are just estimates, and using this sort of model introduces a great deal of uncertainty. But we hope that our efforts to scale the data to different sized communities empowers people to examine these issues in greater detail in their towns and neighborhoods and work to reduce disparities. You can access this BRFSIS data as well as tens and thousands of other data indicators on policy maps. So definitely sign up for a trial if you don't have access already. And please reach out to us during this webinar or any time with questions about our data. So thanks for listening, everyone. And moving on, big data and informatics are huge, especially when it comes to healthcare. We hear a lot about how much of our personal data is being collected these days. We're about to hear from Arthi Verkud of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene about an exciting collaboration to use those data for good. Arthi is a data analyst for the Population Health Team at the Bureau of Primary Care Information Project. She works on epidemiological research using aggregate data from New York City ambulatory practices. Her research ranges from chronic disease studies on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and falls risk in older adults, to infectious disease projects on tuberculosis and HIV prevention. She has a BS in neuro neuroscience from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and an MPH in epidemiology from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Okay, Artie, we've handed over the presenter controls, and it's all you from here. Thank you so much, Morgan, for that great introduction. And thank you to Patrick and Morgan for your great presentations. Very interesting stuff. Um, today, I want to talk to you all about a population health data source called The Hub. And it sits at the New York City Department of Health. And right here in front of you is a map of New York City and the five boroughs where over 8 million New York City residents live. And so it's not really a surprise that the New York City Department of Health has over 6,000 employees who work tirelessly on the health of, health of New Yorkers by implementing great policies and interventions. But we couldn't do the work that we have without um, many, many data sources. One example is the Community Health Survey which is a publicly available data source. It's a telephone-based survey and has information on multiple self-reported disease statuses and demographic information, along with many other questions. Uh, we have several other bureaus at the Department of Health, like environmental and public health labs, that manage their own data sources. Communicable diseases are mandated to be reported in New York City, and so we have databases that uh, accumulate that registry as well. But there are many more. These four barely touch the tip of the iceberg for our data. And today I'm going to talk to you about the hub that sits at the Primary Care Information Project, or also known as PCIP. And the original goal of PCIP was to help providers in New York City obtain electronic health records in a way that helps them improve the type of care they're giving their patients. And we've helped over 4,200 providers obtain meaningful use stage one and stage two, um, which is, sorry. Oh, sorry, I think the presentation may have gotten away from me. No problem, we'll, we'll put it back in just a second. OK, great. All right, you should be good. OK, great, thanks. Um, so um, meaningful use is basically um, a, a legislation that has been implemented to, 
to give standards for how providers should be using their electronic health records. And we here at PCAP have partnered with one electronic health record vendor in particular called eClinical Works, or ECW. And they, our partnership has led to the birth of the hub, which is not an acronym. It actually stands for the model. It represents a hub and spoke model. Um, but instead of just describing it to you, let me show you kind of what it would look like if we had a uh, New York City resident. Um, I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings. So this right here is Gandalf. And uh, Gandalf is going to visit his provider, Elrond, at the Shire practice. And the Shire practice happens to be one of PCIP's practices. And what that means is that um, L, uh, all of Gandalf's uh, information from his visit and potentially some extra demographic information is being recorded in his electronic health record. And just so happens that the Shire is part of our, uh, our subset of PCIP practices that uses the ECW vendor uh, to record health record data. And so what that means for us here at PCIP is that we can develop a question. It can be a research question or something as simple as, how many people at the Shire practice are female between the ages of 40 and 50 and have diabetes? And what we do is we develop this question in inquiry form and submit it through the hub to each of the practice's servers. And in return, we get aggregate data back from each of the practices that answer the question of interest. So in this case, we would get an aggregate count from each practice stating how many diabetics are female and between the ages of 40 and 50. So that yields a lot of interesting and exciting things we can do with this data. But um, you might be wondering who really comprises this group of individuals from New York City. Well, on the right, you can see a map of our quote unquote penetration in New York City um, from the PCIP practices. Um, the yellow dots signify locations of PCIP practices across the five boroughs. And the shading identifies the population of that UHF neighborhood that is walking through PCIP doors. And you can identify, as, as you see the darker shades, where we have better penetration compared to some of the other areas. You can see um, variations at that level. We have this represents uh, data from approximately 690 practices, and we get roughly 650 practices to return data on any given night out of our 730. And this represents over 3,500 3, providers and 2 million patients. So our data set is very expansive and represents a large population of New Yorkers. And our practices are varied as well. We have community health centers, independent practices, hospital clinics, and foster care agencies represented at each of these practices. So what does that mean we can really do with HUB data? Well, we first off can answer some questions about what kind of coverage we have within our HUB population. Um, so what you're looking at right here is not HUB data. It's actually data from that survey I talked about in the beginning, the Community Health Survey. And what we're able to see here is the distribution of diabetics in New York City across all of the UHF neighborhoods. And this is focused to a population of individuals who have reported they have a personal doctor. And the reason we do this is for comparability to our hub data. Um, and the cool thing about this is we can take this information and combine it with hub data to get a sense of what our practices are in terms of the bigger New York City picture. So this map actually integrates data from the previous map. So you can think of the data we just saw as the denominator here, and the numerator is the hub data. And we're looking at the percent of diabetics in New York City that are walking through PCIP practices. And what we can do with this is we can evaluate first um, where are locations where we have really good penetration of diabetes? And that can help us focus our research questions. But second, we can also identify areas where interventions will be actually very useful because we have great penetration. Um, so you can also see from this map, we're, we're capturing about a third of diabetes that's happening in New York. So that's 
an indicator to us that we can actually have, make important improvements in this disease area compared to maybe some others where we don't have as great of penetration. So the coolest thing about my job, I think, is not only can we kind of define what the hub population is relative to the New York City population, but we can also answer some really exciting research questions because we have a huge data set. Remember, I mentioned we have about over 2 million patients we can query in 2014. So what you're looking at here, again, is not hub data. It's actually data from another bureau that has investigated and identified an urgency in addressing falls in older adults in New York City. So the map on your left has identified that in Staten Island, there is a high rate of hospitalization happening due to falls in older adults. And uh, that's, that's a huge area for concern. From other research, we know what kinds of things trigger falls. We know that there are environmental factors, but we also know that the types of medications older adults are being prescribed could influence the risk they have to having a fall. And that's something that we can explore through the hub because of our electronic health record data. And so what we've been able to generate are these awesome maps that I'm really excited about. Um, what you see here are six different medication classifications. Each of the medic classes compile medications that are known to have some sort of risk contribution to falls injury. And the populations we investigated are older adults. And the map depicts the percentage, of, the percentage of the medication that's being prescribed in this neighborhood by where the practice is located. So what we were able to find with this information is that um, Staten Island had really high um, rates of prescribing these falls risk medications. And that was really inform interesting information to combine with the fact that we know there's high rates of hospitalizations happening in these areas. And what that suggests is not necessarily that we should be telling providers to stop prescribing these drugs, but that attention can be called in these areas to this potentially modifiable risk factor. Um, you know, it could suggest that providers it, take into consideration what kind of supplementary information they can provide to their patients to support any possibility of reducing their falls risk since they are now at a higher risk of falling. And um, that's really exciting ways to combine different types of data sources. But we're also able to see some of the variation that's happening here and suggest that these medication classes shouldn't just be cl uh, combined when we're looking at this risk factor in other populations. They should be treated independently because clearly they have a very different um, uh, prescribing rate across different areas, and that suggests a, a bigger picture there to be investigated. Um, so there are a lot of strengths to hub data. Um, we're able to evaluate the extent to which we're documenting, uh, the extent to which providers are documenting within an electronic health record, which also enables us to look at providers who are documenting very well compared to those who aren't and establish metrics that distinguish the two. Because ideally, we want to be conducting research amongst population of providers who are documenting well. We also can uh, query recent and historical data. So one example is we've been able to look at how providers were documenting information in the EHR before and after a law went into place. And that, that time point allows us to look at a bigger trend and, and look at a, a larger picture, which is not always available in all data sets. We're also able to look at race and ethnicity, which is not always an important clinical endpoint, but is very important for a lot of public health research questions. And so while there's a number of strengths that I haven't even gotten to explore with hub data, there are limitations that come with our data as well. We are only as good as the provider is going to document data. And the problem that comes with that is uh, there might be areas of the record that uh, providers are not documenting extremely well. And they're documenting with the intention of a clinical purpose to provide the best treatment for their patient. And th those purposes can sometimes not be as um, in line with public health research questions, which would require more detail than would be expected in a patient visit. 
finally, something that I don't think is either a strength, neither a strength nor a limitation is the fact that we get our data at the aggregate level, which means that we can make very interesting population health conclusions, but we don't have prevalence data. We can't say what the prevalence of any given disorder is with our data because our population is not perfectly representative of New York City. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the following people and thank them profusely for all their help with this work, uh, and both from PCIP and eClinical Works. And if there are any further questions or comments, please, please, please feel free to email me. We're very excited about the work we do here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Arti, for that fascinating look into a truly innovative partnership. Um, so we're going to move into Q&A now, and we've been getting lots of great questions from everyone, but please do continue to send in your questions through the GoToWebinar panel. Um, we are going to start with a question. I'm just going to pull it up here. We're going to start with a question from, um, from Sam. Um, and this is a question for Patrick. What is the smallest geography available for AIDS view? Yeah, he's muted. Okay, let's give Patrick a, a moment to get the audio uh, working again. It looks like he got disconnected. Um, and in the meantime, um, let's, uh, we have a question, a two-part question from Zohar for RT. Um, and the first part of the question is, what about privacy concerns and collecting consent? The second part of the question is, the hub, is the hub used to share data between different services? For example, if Gandalf decides to go to Isengard Clinic, will they know what he, what he went through in the Shire? Hi there. Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, first off, yes, uh, privacy is a really interesting aspect of our data. So you might have noticed in Patrick's presentation that he was able to present some census track level data. And we can't do that because the idea is that we're getting aggregate counts of data. We're not dealing with patient level data. Um, and so there is a minimum to which um, that, that we can present data and, and that's at the UHF neighborhood level. So we have signed agreements with all of our practices and all of this data is, is very well protected because we don't want anything to be able to be re-identified. Um, second, to answer your, your question about sharing across different practices, it's a great question. Um, I don't know really to the extent to which that happens across because in our amongst our PCIP practices we have different records. Um, that's not really the, the major focus of the hub. To, the hub definitely is only a, a querying service, so we, we submit queries and receive data. But as a larger group, P, as PCIP, we do share information with our practices to help inform how they are performing compared to other practices. Um, and there's opportunities there to share information in that community. Thanks. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, so uh, back to Patrick just quickly, um, can you talk uh, just briefly about the, um, the availability of the small geographies and data that you collect for AIDSview? Sure. Um, thanks uh, for that question. So the smallest unit that we report um, data on is the uh, census tract. Um, which we, and we report data at that small geographic level in Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, and, the, dis and, um, and uh, the District of Columbia, sorry. Um, and so uh, un unlike um, what Artie is talking about, uh, unlike what Artie is talking about, we do have, or our city partners have access to that fine um, of a geographic distribution. But as in the same way that Artie is talking about, we also take steps to ensure that, um, that presenting at those finer geographic levels can never result in indirect identification. And that's done through um, only reporting 
data for census tract for which there's a minimum number of people living with HIV and a mim minimum number um, of population in whatever that subgroup is in the census tract. So that's why in the maps that I showed, there are some census tracts that are just sort of uh, grayed out and show no data, and that's to protect privacy. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so much. Um, so now we have a great question from Zachary. Um, and this is for everyone, and I'm going to start with you, Patrick, and then Arti, um, and then um, I'll answer just briefly. So what data exists, whether um, in any source, for childhood, hospital visits, asthma rates, poisoning from environmental factors, et cetera? Um, so Basically, um, what data can be available for, um, for youth specifically, and are there challenges in collecting data for the population under 18 years of age? Um, the only quick thing I'll say about this, I can come back, but I suspect others have more definitive answers, is that one of the great things about surveillance data is that the surveillance authority typically um, it encompasses all age groups. And so surveillance data often can provide information um, because it's critical to understand the occurrence of these health conditions um, in our youth and children, and that's an advantage of surveillance data. Um, as to the specific sources, I'll defer uh, already to you and Morgan and see if you have more uh, specific responses about that, that health state. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks. Go ahead, Arnie. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Morgan. Um, well, so with, with the hub data, um, it, it really comes down to what's being documented in the electronic health record. In terms of data for youth, we have that data. And while PCAP does focus on um, older adults and chronic disease, uh, we have used our data uh, exploring things uh, amongst individuals who are younger than 18. Um, and it, it does the availability comes down to, is something being documented well in the electronic health record. And that's something that we investigate for all sorts of things. We know that some things are, especially when it comes to granularity down to like ICD-9 codes, some ICD codes are documented better than others. Um, so I, I think that covers the broad picture on understanding there. But I'll let Morgan respond. Thanks. Um, yeah, in terms of policy map uh, and a national scale, uh, we have very limited data on um, uh, on children under 18. Um, there are a couple special uh, surveys that um, that are asked of children under 18 specifically, um, and there are a lot of privacy concerns. So we have uh, data on childhood obesity, but not um, not any uh, medical care data specific to children or um, asthma rates um, specific to children. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, so now we're going to, um, let's take a question from, um, hold on a second, lots of questions coming in. Just have to get one. Um, let's take a question from Lauren, um, and this is for Arti. Uh, you touched briefly on how your data can inform clinical practices. Do you have other examples of the practical translation of the research, and do you have plans to build a better bridge between research and practice in the future? Thanks, Lauren, for that question. It's a really great question. Um, like I mentioned, PCIP works with all of the, the data we can pull through the hub to uh, help practices improve the quality of care that they're providing. And, and we work on a number of different types of grants um, that enable us to help refer practices to interventions that will be helpful for their patients. Um, and to go as granular as actually helping providers improve their performance in, in capturing certain data and, um, and improve their patient's health. 
Uh, we have a lot of different interventions that I'd be happy to email about and share. You can also just Google PCIP and see some of the work that we do um, on that point. Um, I think there's always opportunity to expand um, how we use hub data, and we're always investiga investigating um, options to do so. One of the other things we like to do is collaborate with other bureaus so that we can answer some of their research questions and look at overlaps in practice to make sure that um, you know diseases are being reported reliably and um, that we're getting the best information we can on how to improve New York City health. So that collaboration is always there with this data. Great. Thanks for that great response. Um, so now I want to ask a question of every of um, for both Patrick and RT. Have you combined the data you collect with data from any other sources? So either at the record level or in aggregate. Um, so let's start with um, RT and then Patrick. So um, we we don't look at the data at the record level. Um, Right now, uh, we focus on looking at the data from an aggregate level, but we do combine these data sources with many, many other data sources. So in the presentation, I gave two examples, one where we compared it to community health survey data, which is also a DOH data set. Um, we also use outside data sets from New York City Census or the American Community Survey to supplement information to give more richness to what conclusions we're trying to make. And like I mentioned before, we collaborate with other bureaus. Uh, and sometimes that results in combining uh, data at the provider level or, or sometimes at the practice level, um, but never at the patient level. Thanks, Artie, and this is uh, this is Patrick. We actually combine with many of the um, many similar data sources. So, in terms of mapping, we're using census and ACS data uh, to look at at things like um, health insurance coverage, poverty, um, income inequality. Uh, I <clears throat> I showed you one example, but this sort of mashup between data on prevalence and where testing facilities are located is a really common um, use, so that's a, a database, the NPIN database of testing locations. We're um, uh, going to be rolling out some mapping of death data for, that's from uh, national, uh, from death uh, records. And <clears throat> there's a really uh, interesting analysis that, so, so for us, um, a lot of the most interesting stuff is um, stuff that we learn about after the fact, and, and so we put out data sets and hope that people will mash them up with cool other data sets and ask great questions. And so there's a, uh, an academic researcher named Sean Young at UCLA who actually used the HIV prevalence data by county and tried to correlate that with data from tweets or um, Twitter postings um, to try to identify terms in social media that are associated with higher HIV prevalence areas. And, and the thought here, is that um, that someday we'd like to imagine looking at this sort of bulk crowdsourced data that may give us early indications about where new a HIV infections may be occurring while there's still time to intervene. And so, um, so I think one of the beautiful things about making data available publicly is that people can bring a lot of complementary data sources um, and ask great questions. I want to emphasize that for us, just as for Artie, that we don't hold individual um, level data uh, at Emory for any of our maps. Rather, CDC, as the curator of the national surveillance system, holds and gives those summary data to us at different geographic levels. And then we work directly with state and city health departments for our city maps. And as always, we want to strike this right balance between making sure that data are used to their maximal extent to allow the best deployment of health resources and prevention um, interventions while protecting the privacy of people whose data um, are used in aggregate. And so I think we are, as Artie is, and as Morgan, as I know your efforts are, um, always done with, through that filter of uh, making sure that privacy and confidentiality are protected. Great, thank you. 
Um, so we've got a question from David, and I think this is for me. Um, how are the BRFSIS data extrapolated to small geographic areas? Do you, do you use synthetic estimation? Um, so we have a, um, extensive um, documentation of the process that we use to make those estimates, um, which you can find on our blog. But um, just to summarize, it's, um, it's a multi-level um, regression model. Um, so it's, it uses kind of the same um, function in stratification as synthetic, th synthetic estimates do, but it's great. It's based more on the relationships rather than the straight up um, uh, kind of rates by subgroup. Um, so, so basically, think of it like a synthetic estimate, but um, but a more fine grained model where you have um, you have a more nuanced relationship among the um, the kind of boxes within the race, age, income matrix to rely on. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. If not, please uh, please feel free to shoot us a note, and we can provide more information about that. Um, so I have a question from Kelly for um, Patrick. Are there plans to expand AIDS view to include additional cities? Um, thanks for that question, and um, and the answer is uh, there are um, we're, we're sort of constantly evaluating the cities that we're mapping, and we do that based on um, we look at a, a variety of indicators, including the total numbers of cases, um, the case rates in a national ranking, and um, and then the willingness of health departments uh, to work and provide data. And so um, at the last few years, we've been expanding at the rate of two or three cities per year. Over three years, we went uh, from three cities up to um, 30, probably. And we've been expanding at a slower pace uh, in recent years. And we, we base that on essentially going down the list of prevalence um, of the most impacted uh, cities. So I, I think we will continue at, a, at this slower rate um, to add some new cities. Awesome. Thank you. And I think we have time for one final question. Um, so this is a question um, from Patrice. And this is for um, this is Patrice. Sorry. Thanks for the correction, Phil. And this is a question for RT. Um, service providers must submit demo numbers, demographic numbers, for grant purposes. Is the hub concept an example of how this compilation of data will be used in the future in lieu of census data? Hi there. Um, I, I hope I don't butcher your name, Patrice. Um, I, that, that's a very interesting um, question. Um, I, don't, I think the answer would be no, um, but to be honest, I, I don't have a good sense of, of how that works exactly um, from service providers, but I, I don't think that um, the hub necessarily means we will be restricted at this level necessarily. There are a lot of different um, groups across the country and across the world that are working uh, with electronic health record data uh, in different forms of aggregation in order to ensure privacy um, or to develop research questions. So um, my guess would be no. <laughs> Great. Well, it looks like we are coming to the end of our time together today. I'd first like to thank our presenters, Arti and Patrick, and I hope all the participants have learned a lot. I know for sure I learned a great deal about um, the frontiers of health data collection um, and ways to share that information. So. We have two exciting map chats coming up in the series. For those in academia and uh, back by popular demand, next month we'll host a session on using policy map in the classroom. And coming up later this fall, we'll be hearing from local governments across the country about land banks and how a solid data strategy can spur neighborhood revitalization. And again, uh, this webinar will be available online at policymap.com slash mapchats, and we will also be sending it and the presentation slides out by email to all attendees. 
Thanks again to everyone for joining us. And if you have any other questions, feel free to get in touch with us um, by email or um, by phone. All right, thanks everyone.